Howdy folks. What we're going to do in this video, this is part two of Factor Markets. It's really part two of two. Um, so in the last uh, lesson, we talked about what a factor market is. We talked about some of the important concepts in factor markets. And at the very end of the video, I reminded you that in a factor market, because it's a market, there is a supply curve and there is a demand curve. Something else I pointed out in that video is that uh, unlike product markets, the supply and the demand in the labor market or in the factor markets are flipped, especially in the labor market. And what I mean by that is this. In the labor market, households are not demanders and businesses are not suppliers. See, in the labor market, it's people, individuals from households who are going to work and individuals are supplying the labor to businesses and businesses are demanding the labor from the individuals or from the households. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to discuss the, fa the um, variables or the concepts, the, the circumstances that affect a business's demand for labor. And similarly, the circumstances that determine individuals' supply of labor. And what I recommend that you do is pause the video somewhere in here and write down these, uh, all, all of this stuff, because this is what we're going to go through as the determinants of labor. And, over, and then write these down, maybe on a separate page, or cut your page in half vertically, and put your determinants of labor supply in that part. Now, we're going to do the determinants of uh, labor demand first, and then we're going to go over to the determinants of labor supply. And what I've done here in the middle, is you can see I've cut the board in half, and so over here is determinants of lab labor supply, and over here is determinants of labor demand. And so I've put two market graphs here, but I've only put the demand curve because we're only going to talk about uh, demand. And up here, we're going we're to uh, put all the things that cause an increase in labor demand. And down here, we're going to put everything that would cause a decrease in labor demand. And then on this side, I've put two market graphs, but I've only put the supply curve. And up here, we're going to put all the uh, things that would cause an increase in labor supply, and down here we're going to put all the things that cause a decrease in labor supply. Okay, so let's jump right in over here with the determinants of labor demand. So there's three main things. Now I want you to understand that this is not an exhaustive list. These are just three of the main things that are going to affect labor demand for uh, on the, on the part of businesses. Now you yourself could think deeply or notice things out there in the world that you may think uh, affect labor demand on, on the part of businesses, and it's not one of these three things, and that's fine. This is not an exhaustive list. These are just the ones that I'm going to go over here in this principles class, basic ideas that you should understand in terms of demand for labor from businesses or from firms, okay? So the first thing, main thing, uh, the first main thing that's going to affect labor demand is the price of the product that the labor is producing. So if I am a cabinet maker, I am producing cabinets, right? And so here's the idea. So let's go ahead and jump right in here to product price. Businesses can afford to demand more labor. They can, they can hire more workers if they're able to charge a higher price for the product that they are selling. So if they're paying, if they're charging a higher price than they used to, they're making more money because, you know, we multiply price times quantity, right? Like total revenue is equal to price times quantity. And so if the price goes up, then total revenue will go up. Because if we multiply the price times the quantity, uh, and this is a larger number, 
And the, even if this number stays the same, total revenue will go up. And when total revenue goes up, that will also increase our marginal revenue. And in this particular case, if, if we're referring to uh, workers or labor, it would increase our marginal revenue product. And so then we can afford to hire more workers. Now, you might think to yourself, yeah, but if they raise the price, then wouldn't that decrease the quantity? Because in the product, understand this is the price in the product market. The price in the product market. So I'm going to get another color here. Let's get purple. And I'm going to draw a market graph here, quantity and price. And if this is the demand for cabinets, if they, you know, if the price is here, right, and then this is the quantity demanded down here, here's the price, if they raise the price, P prime, then that's going to result in a decrease in quantity demanded. Oops, I put that D in there. That was supposed to be a prime right there. Q prime on demanded. Now, here's what I'm saying, though, is the firm is not arbitrarily raising the price. This is not saying that if they arbitrarily increase the price, if they could arbitrarily increase the price, which in some case, some businesses can arbitrarily raise the price. But we'll get into that in unit three when we talk about different kinds of markets. But let's say that this is uh, what we consider to be a perfectly competitive market. This business is not allowed to arbitrarily raise their price. The price is determined by equilibrium. So we have a demand curve, but we also have a supply curve. And here's what I'm saying. With a supply and a demand curve, we have an equilibrium price. We also have an equilibrium quantity, which is also quantity demanded. Now there's a very good reason why the price might go up. What if there was an increase in demand for uh, the product itself. So if we had an increase in demand for the product, this is a product market, the demand curve in the product market would shift to the right. And when the demand curve shifts to the right, we have a new equilibrium price, which is over here. That is an increase in equilibrium price, P uh, equilibrium price prime. And it would also be an e increase in equilibrium quantity. And now when that market price increases, we would then have an increase in the product price, which would then increase total revenue. And in this particular case, both the price of the product and the quantity would go up, and now we definitely have an increase in total revenue. And because this business now has more total revenue, it's increasing the marginal revenue product of each worker and now the business is able to hire more workers. So their demand for workers will go up. So when we have an increase in the price of the product that is produced by the workers, if we have an increase in the price, that is going to lead to an increase in the demand for labor. And so increase in labor demand looks like this. It would be a rightward shift of the demand curve, D prime. And so here we can say that this will happen when there is an increase in the price of the product that is being sold. Okay. Now, do not mix up price of the product with price of the labor price of the labor, this is a different market. This is the factor market, and that increase in price happened in the product market. By the way, before we forget, I want to remind you that the price in a labor market, so in every one of these graphs where you see P, the price in the labor market, let's write this down here. I'll get rid of this. Price sub labor is referred to as wage rate. Okay, so in the labor market, when we see price, we, uh, we're basically talking about wage rates in that labor market. And you yourself are either in a labor market right now, or uh, you will be in a labor market whenever you finish your degree and you go to get a job. So anytime you're looking for a job, you are in the labor market. And honestly, you can consider yourself in the labor market 
even when you have a job because you might be persuaded to move away from your current job into a different job. Okay, so however much money is being earned in that labor market, in that industry, is the wage rate. And let me also remind you that each one of these labor markets uh, or that the labor market is not just one labor market in the whole world. It's not even one labor market just in the country. We have geographic labor markets. There's the labor market in the Palm Beach area. There's the labor market in the Atlanta area. There's the labor market in the Philadelphia area. So all over the country, each, each regional area is its own geographic labor market. But then you also have labor markets for kind of work. You have the labor market for electricians. You have the labor market for doctors. You have the labor market for accountants. The labor market for IT workers. And then you have little, little sub labor markets that come off. So for example, in IT workers, you'll have the labor market for programmers. You'll have the labor market for network engineers, all different kinds of labor markets. So we have lots and lots and lots of different labor markets and you yourself need to figure out which one or which ones that you are a part of or which ones you would be willing to be a part of. But in every single one of those labor markets, the quantity represents how much is being either demanded or how much is being provided, demanded by the firms or provided by the workers, and the price is the wage rate. That's the wage rate that's, that the firms are willing to pay and the wage rate that the individuals, the workers, are willing to accept. Okay? So, price in a labor market is the wage that is being paid out by the firm and being received by the workers okay, or the employees. So, we're going to have an increase in the demand for labor when the price of the product being sold by that firm goes up. On the other hand, if the price of the product being sold by the firm goes down, we will have a decrease in labor demand and that would be a leftward shift of the demand curve. So I'm going to put D double prime down here. All right? And so up here I'm going to say when there is a decrease in the price of the product being sold by the firm, there is going to be a decrease in the demand for labor. Okay? All right, now let's talk about factor productivity. And in, in particular here, since it's the labor market, we could apply this concept to any factor of production, like uh, raw material, like crude oil or, or uh, um, timber, you know, trees that are cut down. Um, we could apply it to robots or to uh, trucks or other kind of machinery. But in this particular case, we're going to apply it to labor. And when we say factor productivity, I want you to think back to the last lesson. And in the last lesson, we talked about uh, factor productivity in a particular way, using a particular concept. Factor productivity is how much stuff or how much output can be produced by one unit. And if you think back to last, the last lesson, when we talked about how much could be produced by the next unit, so if I add one more worker, how much more output will I produce as a, as a firm, we call that marginal physical product, or MPP, or just marginal product. So what we're talking about here in terms of productivity is we're talking about marginal physical product, or MPP. And so an increase in marginal physical product or an increase in marginal product means that each individual worker can produce more. Now, how would that happen? Well, it could be that there's some sort of technology that has allowed each worker to be more productive. Maybe the training has gotten better and now each individual worker can accomplish more. Or maybe there are some common tools that are used throughout the entire industry and way back in the day they couldn't produce as much, but now that they use the, the better tools, each worker can get more done. For example, uh, there was a time when workers used hand tools mostly. 
Well, when power tools were introduced, I'm sure that the productivity of each individual worker went up. Each worker was able to produce more because they were now using electrical tools or air-powered tools. And so that increased the marginal physical product of each individual worker. Now, what you might think, and you would kind of be wrong, maybe kind of right, but kind of wrong, is this, is you might think that if each worker is more productive, then businesses would just say, well, I don't have to hire as many workers. If I'm producing 100 units, each person used to produce 10. Now each person produces 20. I only need five workers now. I used to need 10 workers. Now I only need five workers. Well, I can see where you're coming from. I can see what you're thinking, but that's not really what businesses want to do. Instead of saying, I need fewer workers to produce the same, what they'll say is, I can now produce more. Instead of only producing 100 units, now I can produce 200 units, and they can sell more product. And when that happens, instead of hiring fewer workers, they may actually think to themselves, let's hire more workers. Each worker can now produce 20 units. Let's not just hire 10 workers, let's hire 13 workers. And instead of only producing 200, we'll produce 260 units and we'll make a lot more money. And so typically what happens is this, is that when the marginal physical product increases, what that leads to is an increase in the revenue that can be earned by each worker. And do you remember that that's called marginal revenue product? And so an increase in marginal physical product leads to an increase in the marginal revenue product of the next group of workers. And because they're making more revenue per worker, they can afford to hire more workers. And that's going to lead to an increase in the demand for labor. So an increase in marginal physical product is going to lead to an increase in marginal revenue product per worker uh, or for the next worker. And that's going to lead to an increase in demand. So if labor is more productive, which means that that's an increase in marginal product, then that's going to lead to an increase in demand. On the other hand, if something happens that causes workers to become less productive, well, gosh, what could cause workers to become less productive? Well, it could be that there was a technology that uh, used to be used, but they have outla outlawed that technology. Maybe the government has said, you are no longer allowed to use that technology. It is dangerous. And now workers have to go back to doing something in a slower way. Or let's say that they institute some kind of requirement that slows down each worker while they work. And so that would lead to a decrease in the, in the marginal product of each worker. And a decrease in the marginal product of workers would lead to a decrease in the marginal revenue product of each of the next wor or of each worker and that's going to lead to a decrease in the demand for labor. So when workers, when something happens in the market, when some circumstance comes up in a business and causes the labor to become less productive for some reason or another, so that's a decrease in marginal product, that would lead to a decrease in labor demand. So here's an interesting story or an interesting circumstance from American history on factor productivity. Uh, that back in the days, in the 1800s, in the days of slavery, uh, I spoke with a friend, he knew a good bit about, um, about the Civil War and uh, American history before the Civil War and then the Reconstruction after the Civil War. And I asked him, I said, hey, um, did the cotton gin, so the cotton gin was a, was a contraption, it was a, a manufacturing technology that uh, made, um, made it more productive to, uh, it, would, it would basically clean up cotton, okay? There was a, when you pick the cotton out of the fields, it would have all kinds of bits and stuff in it. Uh, I'm not an expert on the cotton gin, but basically it, it, it would, uh, it improved the productivity of processing cotton from the fields into a usable product, okay? So it made that process faster and cheaper, this cotton gin, okay? Um, and I said, wow, well, when they started using the cotton gin, 
did they stop using slaves as much because maybe the slaves would have been doing that uh, and so they didn't need as many slaves because of the cotton gin and this is what my friend told me he said actually the cotton gin caused the cotton production in the south, southern states of the United States, it made them actually need slaves more. He said that until the cotton gin came out, the production of cotton was very expensive, and it was coming to a place where the plantations that produced cotton were not very profitable, and they were getting to the point where they were actually going to give up on slavery because they could no longer do uh, cotton production. It just wasn't plausible anymore. And what he said was this, is that apparently when the cotton gin was invented, it made the productivity of each slave higher. It increased the marginal product of each slave. The work that each slave did wound up being more revenue uh, um, beneficial. It increased the marginal revenue product of each slave. And because of that, because of the cotton gin and the employment of the cotton gin, it actually restored the profitability of the cotton industry on the plantations in the South. And that led to an increase in demand for slaves, not a decrease in demand for slaves. Now, I find that very interesting. Um, and it's... Um, I don't know, I just think it's obviously not a very attractive part of U.S. history, but in terms of economics, you can see how if, you know, with this story that um, the idea now is if we apply that same concept today, that technologies that make workers more productive doesn't result in using fewer of those workers, it actually results in using more of those workers. And that's why a lot of people talk about um, you know, technology taking away jobs from people. But this is an example of a situation where technology actually creates more demand for workers, not less demand for workers. And so I think that a lot of people misunderstand. They automatically assume that if there's technology that businesses use to make their product, that they're automatically going to fire a whole bunch of workers because they have the technology. But what's more likely to happen, at least in my opinion, is that when that technology comes out, those businesses will say, wow, our workers are now so much more productive, we need more workers, not fewer workers. And I think that that's a pretty amazing concept. Okay, so now let's move over here to prices of related factors. And I know that you were very excited about this when we did determinants of, of product demand with related products. But here we are, we have the same exact idea here, but now it's the prices of related factors. And this is what I mean by related factors. We have substitutes and complements. In terms of labor, there are things out there that businesses can use that are substitutes for labor. There are also some things out there, factors of production, resources, that are complements to labor. Here are some examples. Robotics, in a way, well, in, in very many ways. Robotics are substitutes or can be substitutes for labor. So let's say that you have an assembly line and you have people that are putting things together, assembling things, right? And then somebody invents uh, you know, these big robotic arms that can assemble things and they're programmed to assemble things the same way that people assemble them. Well, those robotics are going to become a substitute for labor. And so sometimes the prices of those substitute factors can go up and they can go down. And when they go up and down, they, are, they will have an effect on the labor market for that particular job. Similarly, we have complement factors. A complement factor is a factor of production that goes along with labor. So for example, let's say that you have employees that uh, are uh, disassembling 
Uh, I used to have a job actually where I remanufactured toner cartridges. Uh, we would take toner cartridges that go in, in laser printers. We would take the cartridges apart. We would replace the, um, the worn out parts. We would refill it with more toner, put them back together and sell them. I'm sure I've told you this probably at least half a dozen times. All right, so at my workstation, I had several tools. I had an electric screwdriver. I had, um, what else did I have? Electric, well, that's probably my main tool. Electric screwdriver. Oh, I had a, I had a, a little vacuum that I had, had used to vacuum parts. And then there was this giant machine where I dumped the toner out and I would spray off the parts to clean them off. And so um, these tools that I needed to use, I couldn't do my job without them. So if we wanted to hire another worker, we would have to set that worker up with a, with a whole new workstation. And all those tools, the electric screwdriver and the vacuum and everything, those are complement factors. They are factors of production that go along with labor. Um, when I worked at Sam's Club, uh, every time we hired another uh, cart pusher, I was a cart pusher for a little while, they needed a leash. Now that's really cheap, uh, but there are, you know, working in the freezer cooler department, we needed, the employees needed to have gloves and also needed to have uh, training on a forklift. And so all these things that go along with the worker, the tools that they need. In fact, here I'm a teacher, and as a teacher, um, they equip me with a laptop computer um, and some other small items, you know, they give me markers and pens and pencils. And so all of those things are complement factors of production. So here's the idea. When the price of a substitute goes up, so now it costs more money, price, I'm going to put price, and substitute, I'm going to put sub in here, meaning a sub, the price of a substitute product or a substitute factor of production. When the price of a substitute goes up, that means it costs more money to replace me as an, as an employee. And when it costs more money to replace me, they're less likely to do it. They're going to say, well, we don't want to replace him. He costs, you know, comparatively, he costs less. So we don't want the substitute. So an increase in the price of a substitute factor is going to lead to an increase in the demand for me. So an increase in the price of a robot they're going to say no to the robot, and they're going to say, yes, we want more of the people because the robots are too expensive. So an increase in the price of the robots is going to lead to an increase in the demand for, this, for that labor. On the other hand, if we have a decrease in the price of a substitute, now I know what you're thinking here. You might say, well, with this technology, isn't that going to increase the marginal physical product of the worker? That's what you just said, Mr. Ryan. You said that, uh, that it's going to um, make them more productive. Yes, I understand that, but I need to clarify something here. Right now, we are dealing with a ceteris paribus situation. We are not looking at the complicated situation where seven different things are all changing and we're shaking the whole thing out. That's a more advanced idea. In this principles class, we're only looking at how each one of these variables individually, one at a time, affects the labor market. When you get to a more advanced level, then you can mix multiple uh, uh, variables together and make a multivariable equation or a multivariable phenomenon. Okay, So here, if we're only dealing with substitute factors, when the price of substitutes go down, when the price of the robots goes down, they can say, man, Let's buy the robots and let's not hire as many workers because we can replace them with robots. And so a decrease in the price of substitutes is going to lead to a decrease in the demand for labor. And so demand will, the demand for labor will increase when there is an increase in the price of a substitute's price of a substitute. But if there's a decrease in the price of a substitute, then there will be a decrease in the demand for that factor of production, okay? Uh, or that, that the, for the labor that, that is being used in that situation. It's now going to be the opposite for complements. If we have an increase in the price of the complements that go with the labor, if it costs more money to buy the screwdriver and to buy the vacuum and to buy all the, all the other equipment needed 
to, for this person to have a workstation, if it's going to cost me more money, if I hire another employee, then I don't want to hire the other employee. It's going to be harder for me to hire the other employee, not because I can't pay for the employee, but because I can't pay for all the stuff that the employee needs to do their job. And so an increase in the price of the complements is going to lead to a decrease in the demand for labor. So if the, complement, if the price of complement, I'm going to put comp here, if the price of complement factors of production go up, we're not going to demand as many workers. We can't, we can't afford them. If essentially what's happening is when the price of complement factors goes up, essentially what that's doing is it's increasing the marginal factor cost because now it costs more to hire the next worker because when I hire the next worker, I'm going to have to outfit him and that's going to increase uh, my total factor cost. Okay, Not the factor cost of the worker, but the marginal factor cost of the additional tools to outfit the worker. All right. So increase in price of a complement is going to lead to a decrease in demand for that labor. On the other hand, if the price of the complement factors goes down, now when I hire the workers, it's cheaper for me to outfit them. It's cheaper for me to buy all the tools and all the equipment uh, for them to be able to go do their job. And if it's cheaper, that's going to decrease my marginal factor cost and that's going to lead to an increase in the demand for labor. So if I have a decrease in the price of the complement factors, then that's going, to, uh, that's going to lead to an increase in labor demand. Now, ultimately, let's see now what is going to happen in the labor market when any one of these things happen. Okay. So these are all the determinants of labor demand we've described, and we have described whether each one of these, how each one of these would lead to an increase in demand or a decrease in demand in the labor market. And now what I want to explain is how that's going to affect wage rates. Because remember, in each one of these markets, there is still a supply curve. So let's put a supply curve in here, and let's put a supply curve in here. So originally, in the labor market, if this is our original demand curve, demand for labor, and this is our original supply of labor, then our equilibrium price, which is our wage rate, is right here. And our equilibrium quantity is right here. So now, when there's an increase in labor demand, so if the price of the product went up, or the productivity of each factor goes up, or the price of a substitute factor goes up, or the price of the complement factors goes down, we're going to have an increase in demand for labor, and we have a new equilibrium point now where supply and demand, the new demand curve, inter intersects with the original supply curve. And you can see what's happening here, that we will have a higher equilibrium price, which means wages have now increased. We are also going to see an increase in equilibrium quantity for labor. So ultimately what's going to happen is more people are going to be hired and working and they're going to get paid a higher rate. On the other hand, if there is a decrease for labor in that labor market, originally here was the equilibrium point. So this is the original equilibrium price or the wage, original wage rate and the original quantity. And when demand decreased for labor, because firms don't want to hire as many people, that's going to result in a decrease. The equilibrium price in the labor market, actually we'll put double prime here because I put a double prime here. We will have a decrease in the wage rate in this labor market. And similarly, fewer people will be hired because we have a lower equilibrium quantity. And it's important for you to understand what is going to happen to wage rates when any one of these things happen. So if the factor productivity increases, if each factor of production, each, each labor unit, each worker is more productive, that's going to lead to an increase in the marginal revenue product, an increase in demand for those workers. We want more of those people. A rightward shift of the demand curve 
ultimately resulting in an increase in wage rates, and that is good for these workers, okay? Um, and this is a really good reason why workers in an industry should want to be more productive, because the more productive they are, the more beneficial it is to businesses, the more beneficial it is for those businesses to hire more and pay more for those workers, okay? And this is one of the reasons why I believe that in many ways, um, labor unions can be, not are, can be counterproductive to the interests of employees. Because oftentimes, labor unions, when they negotiate a labor contract, they negotiate a, a lower, well not lower, let's just say a, a, a cap on the productivity of each worker instead of letting each worker freely be able to work, uh, produce as much as possible. Now, with that, I also want to say I am a supporter of labor unions in the fact that this, oftentimes businesses, these demanders, they abuse their workers. They are uh, rude to them. They uh, demand things from them that are unreasonable, and they treat them poorly. And if those worker, if those businesses, if those managers would not do that, if they would treat workers like human beings, then they could learn that they're not competitors with each other. They are cooperative. The managers can be kind and polite and supportive to the, to the workers, and then maybe the workers can be kind and polite and hardworking for the managers. But unfortunately, we get this competition thing going between managers and workers, and then uh, workers you know, want, want a labor union to defend them. And if you are going to be a manager someday, then you should consider making sure that you, are, uh, that you treat the employees well and have good relationships with them so that if a labor union ever comes in and it comes time to vote for labor representation, that your employees will say, why would we want a labor union to represent us? Our managers represent us very well. And that's the way, in my opinion, that it should be in management. Okay? All right. So... Uh, so this is determinants of labor demand, and now we are going to move over here to determinants of labor supply. All right, so now we're going to look at the things or the, the variables or the circumstances that lead to us, individuals, being willing and able to provide time and effort to firms, to businesses, Things that make us more willing and able to work, to provide effort and time, and things that would make us less willing and able to provide effort and time. And now I want you to consider something. Let's say, you know, I'm probably going to work well into my 60s, probably even at least halfway through my 70s. And, you know, I'm currently a teacher or a professor, whatever, uh, an instructor, if you will, um, and I am in a labor, you know, in the labor uh, market where I am a supplier of, of, of time and effort for instructing people in how to understand economics and math and other, and other kinds of uh, business. So I'm a part of that labor market. Now, someday when I decide not to teach as an instructor anymore, I will leave that labor market and I will be a part of a decrease in labor supply. But what I might then do is move over to another labor market and work uh, for a different kind of business or start my own business, in which case I would then be become a part of uh, an increase in labor supply in another market. And this happens all the time with businesses. When people either move geographic areas, they, they, they are a part of a decrease in labor supply in, uh, in the Palm Beach area, and they become a part of the labor supply in, uh, in the Los Angeles area because they go over to Los Angeles to go get a job, okay? Or, or Orlando or, or Atlanta or Philadelphia or something like that, or New York. So the things we're going to talk about here are uh, they don't automatically, when there's a decrease in labor supply, it does not always mean that, the, that these people stopped working altogether. Usually what it means is they stopped being a uh, dentist and they decided to go become an accountant or the other way around. Or they, you know, I used to own a, I used to be an entrepreneur and I ran a massage therapy clinic 
And so when I stopped being a, uh, an owner of a massage therapy clinic, I caused a decrease in the labor supply for massage therapy management, uh, clinic management, and I entered and I increased the labor supply for, uh, for instruction, for teaching and, and being a professor. So, uh, so these ideas that we're talking about here we're not necessarily talking about the individuals, but we're talking about a particular labor market. So when you see an increase in labor supply in one market, oftentimes what you see is a decrease in labor supply in another market, okay? Uh, so let's talk about these determinants of labor supply. The first one we're gonna talk about is working conditions in an industry or in a job. Uh, some jobs, have better working conditions than other jobs. Uh, some might argue, I have been both a college professor full-time on campus, I have also been a full-time public school teacher. Uh, I have worked both of those jobs, and I can tell you for the most part that most people would say that the working conditions for a college professor are better than the working conditions for uh, for a high school teacher. Now, personally, I liked both jobs. They both had their benefits. They both had their downsides. So I would put them at about equal. They both provided me with a lot of great opportunities to interact with young people and to interact with learners. But based on the the uh, out there in the world, you know, in the press, people talk uh, so terribly about how, you know, how, how frustrating students are in the classroom that a lot of people might think being a high school teacher is, uh, is worse or has worse working conditions uh, than a college professor. I personally disagree, but let's just say that people, uh, that a lot of people really believe in that uh, or believe that, that idea. So we have two ideas here. We can have better working conditions and we can have worse working conditions. Worse, okay? So better working conditions and worse working conditions. Uh, for example, digging ditches is probably a worse working condition than sitting at a computer uh, with a headset on in, in an air conditioned room. On the other hand, some people who enjoy physical labor may prefer digging ditches over sitting in an air conditioned room at a computer with a headset on because they don't want to talk to people, they just want to do their work. Uh, so it really depends on your circumstance. So in some situations, the working conditions of a job are better. And typically, would you personally prefer a job? You have to ask yourself this question seriously, and I already know the answer. Would you prefer a job with better working conditions or would you prefer a job with worse working conditions? Uh, if you are rational, then you would say, oh, I'd much rather have a job with better working conditions. I'd rather have all the best working conditions and I don't want any of the bad working conditions. I want to have a nice boss. I want to have a, a, a place where I work that's perfectly, uh, the temperature is perfect. Um, I want to do just the right amount of physical labor. I don't want to be um, uh, harassed or overworked. I want the perfect job, right? Nobody says, well, I want to be either too hot or too cold. I want my body to hurt all the time. I want to be in danger all the time. I want the kind of job where my body gets worn out so fast that I can't actually do the job uh, and I have to retire early or I wind up in the hospital or, or disabled. Nobody picks that kind of a job. And because of that, having better working conditions always leads to an increase in the supply of labor. On the other hand, worse working conditions will lead to a decrease in the supply of labor. More people want to do the job that has better working conditions, and fewer people want to do the job that has worse working conditions. And so we're going to put over here, uh, we're going to say better, better conditions of the job, okay, are going to lead to an increase in supply. An increase in supply means a rightward shift of the, of the labor supply curve. Down here, though, we're going to say, we're going to say um, poor or worse. Let's say worse means is the same thing as poor working conditions, okay? Um, poor conditions in the work environment are going to lead to a decrease in the labor supply. So we'll put S double prime. Now this can also be on the micro level if you wanted to. If these are, there's a particular, uh, if there's a particular industry where, uh, or a particular job, if you did the labor market for the McDonald's 
on, you know, 4th Street in, you know, Hoosawatsa, Nebraska. I don't know, making stuff up, right? And the managers there, all the management, they're terrible, right? So nobody wants to work for them. And because nobody wants to work for those managers, it could lead to a decrease in the supply of workers for that particular business. But I wouldn't take it that far. That's going a bit too far, at least in this microeconomics class. But we can say for sure that if a job has better working conditions, more people want to do it. And if a job has poor working conditions, fewer people want to do it. Here, for poor conditions, consider the television show Dirty Jobs where Mike Rowe is the host and he shows you all these jobs that nobody wants to do because they're dirty jobs and they have such terrible working conditions. But a lot of times those people that work those jobs, they get paid pretty good money because there aren't a lot of people that want to do those jobs. And we'll talk about that, the idea of the rates in just a few minutes, okay? Or in about 10 or 15 minutes. All right, let's move on now to rareness of skill. Rareness of skill, what does rare mean? Well, rare means not very uh, common or not very uh, available. Rareness of skill, if it's very rare, that means that fewer people have that skill. If it's not rare, that means many people have that skill. For example, there are not a lot of people who have this skill. The ability to calmly cut open a human being while they're still alive, remove a part of their body, an organ of some sort, put another one of that organ back into their body, sew the person back up, and then cart them off to a room where they're still alive and actually have a better life afterwards. That's a very, very rare skill right there. And so doctors, surgeons who are able to do transplants, that's a rare skill, right? Not many people have that ability. On the other hand, what if the job was picking up light pieces of paper in one room, putting them on a cart, and walking the cart throughout the entire building, dropping off these light pieces of paper, at, in varying rooms or in varying boxes throughout the building. In air conditioning, lots of people have that ability. I mean, you could even do that if you were, let's say, in a wheelchair. Even if you can't walk it, you could e at least wheel the items throughout the building. Now, I'm not bad-mouthing uh, that kind of a job. I'm just saying that that's the kind of job that more people could do. I could do that job. I can't do the surgeon thing. I'll bet most of you watching this video right now could do the job where you move the piece of papers from one room all over the building. But I doubt many or any of you can do the job of a surgeon. And so we know that there's a difference from one job to the next. And there's thousands and, and thousands of jobs in this world. And some of them require skills that are very rare, and some of those jobs require skills that are, that are very plenty, where lots and lots of people can do them. So one possibility is that there are many, there, sorry, uh, there are many with that particular skill, okay? So if the skills that are needed for a particular job, if there are many people with that skill, then that typically results in an increase in the supply of that particular labor. On the other hand, if there are few people with that particular set of skills, one skill or, or a set of skills, that results in a decrease in, in the supply in that particular labor market. And so, you know, when we talk about surgeons, there is a low labor supply probably for surgeons because there are few with the required skills. On the other hand, there's probably an increase in the labor supply for being a, a, for being a, a, um, a, like a mailroom worker in an office building because there are probably many people who have that skill. Again, I want to say I am not bad-mouthing working uh, or belittling working in a mailroom. I'm just saying that if there was a mailroom uh, job opening posted on monster.com or something, they would probably have a lot more applicants 
than if there was an opening for a surgeon. And th for that very reason, they don't have, they don't post, probably don't post openings for surgeons on monster.com. If you're a surgeon, you probably have a network of people or you have a headhunter that finds your job for you if you're, if you're trying to go find a job somewhere else, okay? All right, so rareness of skill, okay? All right, now let's talk about the training costs associated with getting skills. And again, we can talk about doctors here. We can also talk about lawyers and accountants. And then we can also talk about people who work at, you know, work the register at McDonald's or Chick-fil-A or uh, Burger King or something like that, okay? So when the training costs are very low, when there's a decrease in the training cost, I'll put down arrow TC. That means either a decrease in the training cost, meaning it has become cheaper to gain those skills, or it's already low training skills, or training costs, sorry, lower training costs. When it's very cheap, very inexpensive to gain the skills necessary for a particular job, that usually means there's gonna be a lot of people with those skills because it's cheaper to get those skills. So you're gonna have an increase in labor supply. So the labor market is gonna be flooded with people who have the skills where there are low training costs. On the other hand, if training costs are very high, for example, my sister is a lawyer. It cost her a lot of money to become a lawyer. By the way, training cost is more than just the money that it costs to, be, uh, to gain a certain set of skills. Uh, the costs also includes the time. I mean, not only did she have to get a bachelor's degree, but she also had to spend three years in law school. In addition to the three years in law school, she also spent a lot of time, I think one or two years, or at least one year, I think it was two years, uh, in a clerkship with a federal judge. I mean, you have to make contacts, and you have to gain, uh, you have to uh, gain, um, uh, influence with other people. On top of that, she then went and had to have a job working in a law office for a little while to work her way up to where she had a lot of experience as a lawyer. It took a long time and a lot of money for her to become a lawyer. And that's high training costs. And because a lot of people would say, I don't even want to spend the time, you know, I, you know, I don't even want to spend the time to become a doctor. After getting my bachelor's degree, I got to go to medical school, I got to do my residency. I mean, this is, I just spends a lot of time and a lot of money. So to become a lawyer, to become an accountant, a certified public accountant, uh, accountant you don't just need a bachelor's degree, you got to go get extra credits, uh, extra college credits. Then you have to take uh, the CPA, which is like four parts. Uh, and I hear it's an extremely difficult exam, not to mention lawyers have to take the bar and, and then there's the medical boards for doctors. All these jobs where it's very expensive, and those aren't the only ones. There's lots of jobs out there that are very expensive to gain the skills to have those jobs. High training costs means that fewer people are actually willing to take the risk to get those skills, and that's going to lead to a decrease in supply for that particular job. And so here, we're gonna have a decrease in labor supply if there is, sorry, I put a decrease, it's supposed to be an increase, if there are high training costs to have that set of skills, training costs, okay? So you can see here, oftentimes, by the way, lawyers and accountants and doctors, now you may not know this, but uh, they oftentimes have to work in jobs with very poor conditions, you know, very stress, stressful environments with very demanding people. Uh, my father-in-law, he was a dentist, and man, he was a wonderful dentist, right? And I'm sure he loved what he did and he helped a lot of people, but he told me stories, a lot of stories, where people were very, very demanding of him and it could be very stressful. Now, he himself was a very calm and very capable person, and so he wasn't the kind of person who got, who got you know, negatively influenced by the stress, but he told me all these stories uh, about all the, the terrible things that, that patients would do, not paying their bills, making demands that were unreasonable, uh, and so that a lot of times can, can be very poor working conditions, okay? Uh, all right, last one here, wage rates in other markets. Uh, okay, so here's the idea of other markets. Uh, so here I am, I live in the Atlanta, Georgia area. I live just east of the city of Atlanta, uh, and nearby, not that far away, um, are several other cities. For example, if you go west of Atlanta along I-20, there's the city of Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, if you go up 
Interstate 85 far enough, you come to Charlotte, North Carolina, and if you go uh, east on I-20, you'll eventually come to Augusta, Georgia, and you'll eventually also come to Florence, South Carolina. Uh, and so these are close by markets where jobs could be found. And the idea of wage rates in other markets goes like this. One idea geographically is this. Let's say that I have a job in Atlanta. Let's say that I'm a, an electrician in Atlanta. But let's say that over in Birmingham, Alabama, electricians have started to get paid more money because there's a lot of electrical work over in Birmingham um, and there's just a lot that needs to be done. Something happens in the market, in the labor market over there that causes, it could be one of these things happens. There could be an, uh, an increase in uh, the price of substitutes or an increase in the productivity of electricians over in Birmingham, Alabama that increase the demand curve and increase the wage rate. And now electricians over in Birmingham, Alabama are getting paid more money than electricians here in Atlanta. Well, because the wage rates in that other labor market are higher, I may decide, hey, I'm going over to Birmingham to get some work because they're paying more over there in Birmingham. Now I may have to go, maybe I only get the job for about six months, maybe I only move over there temporarily, or maybe I'll, I already live between Atlanta and Birmingham, and instead of driving over to Atlanta, I'll drive over to Birmingham. Uh, the idea here is this, is that the wage rates in some other labor market went up and now that labor market is more attractive to me than the labor market I'm in right now. Let's say that I'm a teacher and all of a sudden, you know, I have the ability with, uh, you know, I understand mathematics, I understand economics. Let's say that the, uh, the, the, in the labor market for people with my skills, uh, communication skills, math skills, economic skills, uh, that the wage rates go up. I might be tempted to leave teaching to go get that job and it might be in the same geographic area but it's a different job, it's a different kind of job, a different career labor market. And if the, if the uh, labor wages, or if the wages in that market are higher, I might leave my job and go over to that labor market. Similarly, what if the market I'm in right now, what if wage rates go up? Well, that could attract people from other labor markets. If I'm an electrician in the Atlanta area and the wage rates for electricians in the Atlanta area go up, I might expect to see people coming over from Florence, South Carolina, or from, uh, from Charlotte, North Carolina, or electricians coming over from Birmingham, Alabama to come work in Atlanta because they want to come to the place where, it, uh, where wages are higher. And this is what we mean by wage rates in other markets. So here's the idea. If over there in that other labor market, there is an increase in wages, and I'm going to put other, meaning other market, wages in another market go up, then in this market, supply is going to go down because people are going to leave this market and they're going to go over to that labor market. So that's going to lead to a decrease in labor supply in this market. And so here, there will be a decrease in labor supply in this market if there is an increase in wages in other MKT, in another labor market. On the other hand, if in other markets, other labor markets, the wages go down, so let's put weight, decrease in wages, parenthesis other, other markets, that is going to lead to, so in the other market, wages went down, so over there, the people over there are going to be very dissatisfied. They're going to say, I can't make as much money over here. So I'm going to move to that labor market. So they are going to come over here and work where I'm at. So that's going to be an increase in supply because people are leaving there and coming over here. And that's going to lead to an increase in labor supply. Okay? And so up here, we would have an increase, a rightward shift of the labor supply curve if there is a decrease in wages in another, in another labor market. Now, this other labor market is usually somehow related to the labor market that I'm in. Okay, so in a way, we're saying related, a related market uh, wages. Okay? 
All right, so these are all the determinants of labor supply. Again, well, I say all of. It is not an exhaustive list, just like this was not an exhaustive list of the determinants of labor demand. You could probably sit with some friends taking economics, the same economics class, and say, hey, let's come up with one more determinant of labor supply, or let's come up with one more determinant of labor demand. I promise you it won't take you long to come up with something that affects labor supply or labor demand, okay? But these are the main ones that I want you to understand. This is a principles class. Now, what is gonna happen to wages in these markets? In fact, I have a question for you. Given this situation, you might think, if we were to look at this labor market and this labor market, the labor market with the increase in labor supply and the labor market with the decrease in labor supply, you might think to yourself that this is the one that you wanna work in. But I would caution you about drawing that conclusion. Sure, do you want to have the job with the better working conditions, okay? Where there are lots of other people who have those skills, where training costs aren't very expensive so you could get into that industry very easily, and where uh, wages are lower in other markets. Yeah, wages are higher in my market. Oh, I don't know about this. This could spell bad news for you and here's why. If I throw a demand curve in here, so I'm going to put a demand curve in here, you can see that originally this was the equilibrium intersection point, and here is the original equilibrium quantity, or excuse me, equilibrium price, so the, the wage in, the, in this industry. And the equilibrium quantity is right down here. Now, when supply increases because it has better working conditions and there are many people who have the skills and it's really cheap to get those skills, you can see what's going to happen here at equilibrium. The equilibrium price in this market is going to go down. And so that means that there's going to be a decrease in wage rates. You are going to get paid less money for having that job and being in that industry. Now, that could be fine for if you don't mind making a little less money than you would have. It still might pay plenty of money, enough for you to uh, have a great life and, and, and live a, a, a very satisfied life. But understand that it will have decreased wage rates. And now, the good news is it'll have an increased number of people. You may like working in an industry that has more people that do that thing. So you have a lot of community and a lot of... Uh, um, uh, colleagues. But if you were to work in an industry with poor working conditions, where few people have those skills, where the training costs are very high, and where wages might be higher in other markets because pe so people are leaving this industry, you are going to see an increase in wages. See, here's the original intersection point, so this is the wages, and here is the equilibrium quantity, the quantity of, of people working. Uh, in, in that industry, and when supply decreases, or when it's lower, when it's a lower labor supply, that means that we have a higher equilibrium price. So double prime there, that is an increase in wages. So this is higher wages in these jobs, and there are fewer people that work those jobs. And when there are fewer people who work a job, if that job is very important, if that job is needed, but there is a lower supply of it, then when there is a lot of demand for it, like doctors, like nurses, like lawyers, uh, uh, information technology over the last 20 years, m any competent person that has gone into information technology and has been able to you know, communicate with people and get along with people and keep their job, those people have made a lot of money. In fact, those people in the information technology, they move from job to job to job, and, and almost every time they move from job to job to job, they're, get, they're getting a higher paycheck when they move from job to job because the job they're in isn't paying them enough. Well, they were, they were paying them a lot, and then they were like, man, I can go over there and get $10,000 a year more. They just move the job and, and get a $10,000 a year raise or a $5,000 a year raise. Why? Because there aren't as many of those people available, but they are in high demand. All right, these are the determinants of labor demand, the determinants of labor supply. You need to know what they are, how they will affect supply or demand. You also need to know whether they will affect supply or whether they will affect demand. I may, not let, I may, I may ask you a question where I don't tell you whether it's affecting demand or supply. You have to know which one it affects. Then you have to know whether it's going to increase or decrease uh, supply or demand. 
And then you also have to understand how it's ultimately going to affect wage rates, whether that would increase wage rates or decrease wage rates.